you know, I, I made kind of an early mistake, and, and I should know it as old as I am, but I kind of got it all into gear there. Welcome to episode 62 of the Hunt Backcountry podcast, presented to you by Exo Mountain Gear. In this episode, we have a repeat guest. Way back in episode 5, we spoke with Rob Shaw, and he's back to join us for this episode as well. Rob is a strength and conditioning coach at a gym in Jackson, Wyoming. But it's not the gym you're thinking of. It's not bodybuilding, it's not meatheads, it's not a gym where you perform in the gym. It's not a gym that's about just looking good. It's a gym that's all about performance and the outdoors, and specifically in the mountains and the back country. Rob works with professional athletes, with military, with tactical athletes, guys who climb mountains for a living, guys who endure the outdoors for a living, and he helps them be better prepared. Rob himself is a passionate hunter, which we talk about in the first bit of this episode, really just catching up on Rob's season. This was his first year bow hunting after spending many years meat hunting with a firearm. And so Rob had uh, a lot of lessons that he learned this fall, and we get the opportunity to learn alongside with him as he shares those lessons in this episode. Of course, being a strength and conditioning coach at a gym and training mountain athletes, we dive into a bit of that as well. So we do talk fitness and training in the second half of this episode. If you guys haven't caught it yet, you don't have to listen to Rob's first episode with us, episode five, as a prerequisite to this one, but I would actually highly encourage you to go back and do that. Rob has some programs written specifically to prepare for backcountry big game hunting, and we actually dove deeper into those in that first episode with Rob, episode five of the podcast, more so than we did even in this episode. So these two episodes combined are a great one-two punch of training knowledge if you are ready to step up your game and hunt the backcountry more effectively. One last thing before we dive into the show, just want to thank you guys for the comments and the ideas that you have sent in thus far for what you want to see from the podcast in 2017, and just want to give one last call for you guys to do that. Just email us to podcast at exomountaingear.com with any ideas that you want us to tackle, any questions you want answered, topics or guests that you want to see on the show, and we will do our best to make that happen in this upcoming year. As always, thank you guys so much for listening. You can find the show notes for this episode at exomountaingear.com forward slash 62 for 62. And in those show notes, I share my experience with Rob's programs, some of my favorite exercises and movements that I picked up from Rob's programs and more. So be sure to check that out. Okay, here's the show with Rob Shaw of Mountain Tactical. All right, well, Rob, welcome back to the show. How are you doing? Good, Mark. Good. How are you? Yeah, well, thank you. Steve, you're online. How you doing, buddy? Good. Yeah, it's a beautiful snowy day here in Boise for sure. So Nice. Yeah, we're yeah. just, just post-Christmas. This one should be coming out just after the new year. So timely episode for guys who are getting ready for next season. But before we talk about next season and getting ready for next season, uh, I'd love to talk to you, Rob, about this past season. Um, you know, you're... A previous guest, you were way, way back on episode five, which seems like an eternity ago, and we talked about uh, fitness for hunting and, and some of your experience there and what you have to offer, which we'll certainly get to. But I know that in uh, 2016, you spent a fair amount of time bow hunting as well, kind of did some new adventures, learned some new lessons, things like that. So where can you, where can you get us started on the hunting side of things? Just tell us about your season and how that's been for you in 2016. Yeah, you know, I uh, kind of a meat rifle hunter before last year. I had kind of dabbled a little bit around in bow hunting, but uh, last year um, I I decided to kind of tr- take a turn and really hit it hard. And uh, in hindsight, it was like my best season season ever hunting, and also my worst season ever. <laughs> <laughs> That's a familiar feeling. <laughs> <laughs> you know, on my 
and, and I guess I can start with the worst. I, I wasn't able to harvest an animal with a bow. Um, um, so that I guess is maybe a, a worst part, but maybe the best part for me was that not harvesting an animal, but spending so much time out there and seeing mm-hmm. so many incredible sights and having so many incredible experiences. It, it kind of, it took me, you know, a while to get into it and some frustration and some missed opportunities before I realized for me what hunting is about. And, um, as kind of a, you know, rifle meat hunter before I taste a little bit about that, but I was really, you know, I wait to the end of the season and just go shoot a cow or something like that. Um, but for me this year it really turned out to be about spending time in the mountains, um, about appreciating, um, what hunting does in terms of making you pay attention Mm -hmm. to your time in the mountains about exploring new areas, even though I'm fifth generation, you know, Wyomingite and I've lived in this, this area, you know, for 48 years minus my service time. Um, man, I saw just some incredible new areas and explore some new places. So, um, in hindsight, the little bit of bitter is, is getting, is, uh, getting less and less in the, the great experiences I had is, is more and more, and it's really changed the way I think about hunting. And I think in a mature way and in a better way. Um, I know here in, in uh, I've got, I'm not much of a climber, um, but I work with a lot of climbers and uh, every once in a while they'll take me out rock climbing. And I remember this real good climber telling me one time, he says, you know who the best climber is? And he had a big smile on his face. And I said, who? And he says, it's, it's the guy who's having the most fun. Mm-hmm. And I think, and I think it's take it took me a you know this uh, this season kind of realize that's kind of what it is for hunting too. Yeah, there's a lot of truth to that. Did, was this something like this whole change in perspective? Did you sort of feel that during the hunt or during the hunt were you just like so focused and not you didn't have that sort of detachment and perspective? And it's not till after season that you're sort of looking back and seeing this perspective. How did that work for you? You know, I was I was able to. I guess grow up pretty early during the hunt and kind of start to realize um, w- what what it was really about. The, my season was kind of it was kind of interesting. I started you know scouting for deer, you know probably in the middle of June, and I was you know hitting it hard every weekend, you know a couple nights every weekend, and uh, and going to these new places. And uh, you know it took me two or three trips just a spotted bedded deer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but man, I was so excited when I spotted that first bed of deer. It was amazing. <laughs> um, and then here in Wyoming, I, I drew an antelope tag. Even residents have to draw an antelope tag here. And the area I drew in, it's not like you know the grasslands or the brush. It's like kind of hilly, and the antelope get up in the in the hills. And then the, and uh, and so on uh, August fifteenth, I started antelope hunting. Um, and I ended up making, I think I finished at 27 failed stocks. <laughs> wow. <laughs> On some time, I was busted every which way. At first, those, those freaking animals are amazing. Yeah, their sight um, and everything. Oh, my God. I mean, it made me such a better hunter. Um, but uh, I was busted by sage chicken, by other antelope. I was. Uh, I went up after the the rifle season started, I was busted by a four wheeler. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, but that, that, um, just, I got, I got close a couple times. I, I, I missed one time. I got really close a couple times. Um, I know that one of the things you read about first time bow hunters, if you get a first shot, you should take it. Um, I made this really kind of fun, incredible stock where I was like climbing underneath trees and over logs and, and got into this, uh, you know, I was got about 40, 50 yards away from this bedded group, uh, antelope. There's one big buck there and a shitload of does. And I had a shot at the doe, but of course I wanted the buck. And so I ended up getting busted and missing that opportunity. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, just paying attention, um, you know, to, to the animals and, and just to the mountains. It, it really made me see mountains in a, in a different light. My, as I've gotten older, you know, I'm 48 now. When I was, you guys are in your 30s, right? Still, yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> yep, yep. As in my 30s, I just like going fast in the mountains. Um, I was never much of a rock climber per se, but you know, I'm talking. You know, we did the Gannett Peak from Elkhart and Trailhead there, and 
near Pine Dale. It was like a 50 mile trip in 24 hours, you know, just in and out early, like going out and doing 20 mile trips really fast. And, uh, um, some of the stuff like I saw you guys did your 40, 40 mile suffer fast. We do that all the time. In fact, people didn't like going with me because that's what I like to do. <laughs> <laughs> go, 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 go. But as I got older, I, I kind of found I don't like moving as fast in the mountains anymore. Mm. Uh, it, I changed from a workout to, to something different. And, uh, um, and so this, this year's hunting really, really helped, I guess, coincide with that. And, uh, and so it, after I was able to slow down and, and stop being a punk and kind of realize <laughs> how, how blessed I was to be doing what it was, where I was doing it, it, uh, it really ended up being a, a great season, um, but I certainly learned some lessons. Yeah, um, man, that's that's so cool to hear that perspective for sure. Yeah, it is. I mean, so many of us are just hard chargers, so focused on like getting the job done that you know we miss out on what's happening around us in the moment. That's a good lesson to learn for sure. So, what are what are some of the specifics that stand out to you, Rob? Going from you know a rifle hunter. Or just, you know, maybe just hunting later in the season versus earlier in the season, just the differences in the timing of archery, things like that, like getting down to specific lessons or things that stand out or uh, different approaches that you'll take next year. You know, I, I made kind of an early mistake, and, and I should know it as old as I am, but I kind of got all into gear there. You know, I think starting about this time last year, you know, I, I think I went down and bought one of them new Matthews bows in February or something and started shooting it. And I think mm-hmm. I bought the bow because it was like the, you know, that all the reviews had it as the best bow. And, um, and then I started shooting it and I kind of changed my release round. And anyway, um, my big lesson coming uh, look in hindsight was there are so many different distractions out there that kind of keep you from what's important. I think about hunting and uh, gear is one, you know, all it's just different gear discussions and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, there's a, you know, there's guys on the industry side, I think. Um, and it's kind of their goal to, you know, keep you talking about it all year long and end up selling you stuff. I think you get caught up and I, I call it a circle jerk. Um, yeah. <laughs> guys back and forth, you know, and you'll hear the guys like, Oh, we got lots of synergies between you and me. And that's always a, <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So those, those were, I, the, the other thing just in, just in terms of my own shooting, you know, I never really shot a bow much, but you know, I was really working on God, I chased that damn arrow around the target a bazillion times and, uh, um, and was really looking on getting really accurate, really fast. And, uh, you know, when I, I did get, I missed a, a couple bucks this year and, um, I think I missed one at like 60 and one at 40 and especially the one at 40. I mean, I should, I should have hit that, hit that buck, but you know, it's one thing to obviously shoot, you know, in your backyard, there's no stress and, and shoot under stress. And I've developed a way to train marksmanship under stress with assault rifles. We use it with our military guys. And, uh, you know, so after I had that experience, I started applying that same theory to my bow hunting, understanding you don't need to hit a two inch target. You have to hit, you know, a 12 inch target or nine inch or whatever it is under stress. And so, um, that was one distraction was just spending so much time almost not necessarily overthinking, um, shooting but not doing it in something that would transfer to the field i'm mm-hmm. not a i'm not a target shooter right? right um so um that that was a big big distraction um it was interesting too i didn't get distracted on the fitness side but it's kind of interesting in and kind of the hunting thing the industry thing with the some of the events that going on i was at my local shop i think it was july 14th or something right around the middle of july you know, I was looking at gear. I should have been doing something else. I was still obsessed with gear, I guess. <laughs> and and, uh, and the guys there, hey, you're going to go up to Montana with us to do this, you know, this hunting event. You know, I was thinking to myself, it's frigging the middle of July. And, I mean, <laughs> no, I'm going to go scout for deer. Right. <laughs> I'm, yeah. gonna go, I'm not going to do some artificial hunting event <laughs> Yeah. I, when I can go actually do the real thing. Uh, <laughs> it's just some of the distractions, I think, that uh, – Especially, I mean, I saw that one because I guess I'm 
a professional strength conditioning coach, but some of the gear stuff I didn't see, and I'm wise to it now. I ended up, I never did, I was never able to get comfortable with that bow I got, so I ended up getting another one. I think it's on your recommendation, Steve or Mark. You guys used to shoot primes or something. I went, they, the local shop started selling primes. At one shot, one of them primes, like, gosh, this thing's simple and easy. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah, they're really yeah. nice bows for sure. <laughs> so I, I got one of those, and, uh, you know, I'm not going to be getting a new bow this year. I'm going to be, but anyway, that's that's some of the, the, the lessons learned. I learned for for sure. Yeah, um, that's good stuff. Could you dive into? Um, and this kind of brings it back to, you know, uh, something that I love about what you guys do, and it's it's more than just fitness and strength and conditioning. And I guess just to give listeners who are um, new, we, we should back up and kind of rub what you introduce more of what Mountain Tactical Institute is about. Um, really it was called mountain athlete back when we had you on the show and there's been some changes there. So we could certainly cover that, but go a, go ahead and give us some context, but B, I want to get back into that, that research piece that you mentioned, you mentioned about shooting under stress with your tactical athletes. And then I, w- I would love to hear more about how you applied that to your bow shooting. But first, I guess let's, let's go ahead and back up and give that bigger um, picture about what is the mountain tactical Institute from a, fitness and research and you know all the areas that you guys are working in right now yeah we uh you know we started uh, back almost 10 years ago um, with mountain athlete i changed careers and came up here to jackson i was working in town a little bit south of here opened a gym wanted to work with the uh, uh, guides and stuff and uh crust it was just coming on right now so we, i think we were the first kind of garage gym here and in, in jackson and uh um made all kinds of mistakes. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I, um, what, what we kind of found both the, on the mountain and tactical side was all that matters is outside performance and, mm-hmm. um, nothing in the gym matters. All that matters is how well you, you perform doing the event. And it took me a, a while to kind of figure that out. And then, um, once I did, I was surprised to learn that, in the strength and conditioning world, there really hadn't been much theory developed to determine what matters, and then also how do you train for that. Um, and so, uh, uh, over the years, we almost always kind of been a research facility in the sense that we identify kind of what what matters, developed uh, programming to to train for that, assessed how the programming worked fixed it or tried to fix it, changed it, tried it again. And just this loop, continual loop of, you know, um, theory, develop, assess, redeploy, try it again. And um, what a couple years ago, um, we really started taking a hard look on the research side and getting into um, the more scientific um, research on the strength and conditioning side. Um, we kind of found that the academic approach to research in general wasn't a good fit for what we wanted to do. We want all of our stuff that we reproduce to really have a, really have a mission direct, um, application. And, um, so what we found with typical academic research on the strength and conditioning side was that it's designed primarily to get published and to meet the criteria to get published and get through the boards. It has to be super, super narrow and it gets so narrow. In fact, it almost loses its applicability to the, to the real world. I say lots of times how many studies have been completed on the proper depth or squat depth for back squats. Mm-hmm. <laughs> probably, probably 10,000 of them, you know, and they all got published, but Jesus, how many times can you hammer that? Um, uh, <laughs> So uh, we developed our own research approach we call mission direct research, and there's some significant differences. We're not interested in the best answer. We're interested in something that we can apply now um, and that can make a difference now, and then we'll keep on trying to find that right, the best answer. But if we can do, if we can give our, our athletes um, some information, a way to train or something else that will make their mission performance better now, we want to do that. What we what we started doing was expanding beyond 
um, fitness and to take and look at other areas of mission performance, um, gear, clothing, um, uh, policy for law enforcement, and, and on the mountain side, kind of looking at avalanche education. We've done some interesting work there. Um, and so now we're kind of looking and working in all these different areas. And for me, it's really exciting. Our, our company, you know, our kind of our mission is to improve mission performance for mountain and tactical athletes and keep them safe. And, uh, by working in all these different areas, we're, we're asking, I think some questions that, um, nobody else is asking. Um, we're doing some research and looking at some areas that no one else is really interested in. It seems like the research that's been done is either super high level um, where it's in, you know, strategy or policy or so narrow, it's not applicable. So we were interested in, you know, and stuff that people can use. Um, just a, you know, a couple examples on the, on the gear side. Um, you know, we, we were interested in, um, testing, um, sleeping bag performance in a real world way. Um, so, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the way sleeping bags are rated, they, they sent off to these different labs. There's, they're testing facilities there's some in europe some here and uh they have this really kind of a inter- i think they put a dummy in the in the in the sleeping bag you know and, and it's really specific but it turns out that some of the labs um you know have a little bit of different ways they they tweak stuff <laughs> mm-hmm. we're, we were just interested to see if the north face 20 degree bag kept something as warm as a marmot 20 degree bag um you know and so we uh we designed a one of the things about our mission direct research is we want to develop research that is applicable, but also that can be repeated. So we're constantly looking to to um, develop testing procedures that someone else could do, anyone else could do, really, wherever they're at. On the sleeping bag thing, we ended up putting bottles. We ended up. Uh, I had one of the guys who trains with me. He's a ma- assistant manager at one of the local grocery stores, and uh, so we ended up putting uh, bottles of water, testing the temperature before and after. And sleeping bags in his freezer, <laughs> his walk-in freezer for ice cream, <laughs> and, and believe it or not, we got some great data out of that. Um, and so, and we're just, you know, kind of applying stuff like that. We, uh, you know, you you guys both use jet boils or something somewhere, I'm sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We were we were kind of interested to see how many liters of water you could boil with one of those small canisters. That, you know, because I'm always like, oh, should I bring a new canister? You know, how many? You know. <laughs> I think we got like 11 liters or 22. I forget what it was. It was amazing. We had an intern here last summer just boiling canisters of water just to see, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's some news you can news you can use. We we uh, we took a hard look at um, stuff would apply to you guys. It, uh, we took a hard look at um, what were the biggest calories for the buck in terms of um, uh, freeze dry food candy bars, stuff like that. Turns out that the, the biggest calories for the buck and per ounce freeze dried, I think is mountain house, uh, Mac and cheese. And I think the biggest calories per buck just in raw calories is a, is like a Twix bar or peanut butter Twix bar in terms of it's a weight also. Um, mm-hmm. so we we're trying to look at not only kind of hardcore research, but just some interesting stuff like that, that, um, the athletes we work with can apply right away to, to uh, what they do in the field. Yeah, that's cool. And, you know, on top of that research and, you know, some of the things you, (laughs) I mean, you mentioned quite a bit from testing food to, you know, walk-in freezers, but just to reiterate, I mean, even the work that you guys are doing in the gym, you're working with uh, professional athletes all of the time. I mean, you kind of mentioned that you were testing your theories, you're changing your response, you're changing your programming based on outcomes. And a lot of that's done with professional athletes, um, with tactical athletes, whether that's, you know, law enforcement or military units that you work with. But giving that context back to the the shooting stuff, which I'd love to hear more about, you have no doubt worked with a bunch of um, military and law enforcement athletes and then even done studies on shooting with them. So what are some of the findings of those studies? And then more specifically, you mentioned you applied that to your bow shooting. How, what, what types of things did you apply that helped you with that archery shooting? We, on the, on the tactical side, we, years ago, when we first started working with military guys, we had a Lieutenant Colonel. He was an Air Force special ops, ops guy. 
And he said, hey, you know, it would be really awesome if you could develop a, a system to train accurate marksmanship under stress and um, in a systematic way. And uh, so um, I bought a couple ARs and, and spent a buttload on uh, five, five, six ammo. <laughs> and we started uh, testing this idea out. How could we systematically train accurate marksmanship under stress? In, in the tactical world with, uh, with shooting, I mean, there's a bazillion shooting schools and they're all, you know, run by ex-special forces guys. And there's a bunch of different theories about, you know, how you should hold your weapon, how you should mount. I mean, it gets really, plus the weapons themselves talk about a gear world. I mean, the, the black, the black rifle gear stuff is, I mean, entire magazines about it. Right. Um, but we were just interested in, we're not marksmanship instructors. I was in the coast guard for Christ's sake, you know, I never shot an AR. (laughs) Um, but we were interested in, in this developing the system and, um, in the strength conditioning world, we, we have something that's called progression. And so, you know, if I have you doing, you know, 10 push ups this week, and next week I have you do 12 push ups, and next week I have you do 15 push ups, that's just called progression. It's a way to keep focused but improve your performance um, in a systematic way. And so we developed a system we called Range Fitness that um, systematically trains um, accurate marksmanship under stress. And there's different stressors that we apply. Um, we, we apply a little bit of uh, physical stress. There's a time limit. There's an ammo limit. And then under that time limit, ammo limit, they have to hit the target so many times. Um, and if they get that level, then they go up to the next level, which means with the same number, same amount of ammo, same amount of time, they have to hit the target more times. Um, and so it took us a long time to do this. When we first started, we got really elaborate. You know, we had guys doing sandbag get-ups and running around the block, you know, on this and that. And as we developed it more and more, the what we've kind of learned in all the work that I do is that, and I'm sure you've seen it just with the, um, the packs you guys are working on, is that sophisticated design is immature. Really good design is really simple, right? <laughs> Um, you're laughing. You know what that's like. <laughs> couldn't, be, couldn't be more be, better stated. Yeah. But the interesting thing about that maturity, when I say mature, it's not like you're a immature pack designer. <laughs> the design itself is immature, and he, and it takes you know churning and use and thought, and the design itself matures. And that that happened with our range fitness, and uh, we got around. We got away from doing all these exotic exercises to doing either burpees or short sprints, and um, we um, developed um, really effective um, methods of, you know, just really testing this. We we found out with um, with hitting the target that we could only we developed these drills, but we found out that we could only advance so far just doing the drills. We had to step back and and do some fundamentals, um, fundamental shooting, um, trigger control, um, you know, or jerk, you know, same thing in, in bow stuff, sight picture, you know, all, all those types of things. Um, and then we started working those fundamentals into these, what we call them training sessions. And the training sessions would begin with a, with a, a stress drill and then it would end with a stress drill. And so, um, um, over the course of time, we developed this this system, and we deployed the system with lots of different experienced shooters. And it was really interesting to see the response, um, because even you know special forces guys get caught up in gear and image and everything else. <laughs> and so we'd go out and we'd shoot with the special forces team, and when everybody first does this, just about everybody sucks at it. They're just not used to it. It's like a new drill, right? What we found, though, is that the experienced guys, the real professionals, the quiet professionals who weren't caught up in ego, they would kind of step back, start paying attention more to their fundamentals, and quickly get better at it. The young guys who were new and had all those other things going on, well, they just get more and more pissed off. They get mad (laughs) at me. They blame the drill. They say the target was too far away. It was too small. Yada yada yada, um, but the but you know that the experience of good shooters they were just they would steadily improve, and what we heard from everybody was that no matter what a level shooter they are, is that doing the drills made them 
become a better shooter because they had to really concentrate on fundamentals. So the drills them, themselves um, improved fundamentals. One of the things that is key to this, and I actually had an engineer working on this on archery side this summer, was we use metal targets um, for the AR shooting, and uh, we they're reactive. So if you hit it, you know, which is good because it knows if you made a hit. Um, it adds stress if you miss it. And we'll do these with guys next to each other. And so if the other guy is going ping, 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 and you're not, it adds stress, right? It's good. We're, we're interested in <laughs> increasing the stress <laughs> on you. We, I hired a, I had a mechanical engineer on staff this uh, summer working on a couple projects for us. And one of them was a reactive target for archery. We, we weren't able to develop this, but I knew that for range fitness, we, for our free perspective, we need to develop a reactive target. You need to know if you hit the target right when you make the shot. You can't pick up your binoculars or walk down there. Um, you need to know right then. And uh, we, gosh, we tried all types of different things. We tried a, a light system, and uh, we wanted to develop something ideally that guys could just put on their regular foam target. Um, anyway, um, I spent a lot of money and, and uh, did a lot of geeky stuff, but weren't quite able to get it right. And, uh, um, so I'm still kind of working on that. What I've come to use is just uh, balloons with a little bit of baby powder in them. Um, uh, a balloon is about the right size. And if you have two or three targets, you can get two or three balloons up. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially, um, what, what you do is, uh, um, do what, what I'll do. I'm still kind of working through this and I'll be deal, uh, doing a lot of it here this winter in my gym can shoot in my gym it's just long enough um but uh last year we would do like uh um we like 15 meters for a sprint so we do four 15 meter shuttle sprints so at the firing line down back down back uh, under a certain time limit and we would keep the uh um, arrow notched in the bow you know your and you're actually your your release on on the uh on the bow ready to go so you're actually running kind of ready to shoot right like an elf and a hobbit i don't know <laughs> 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 but you'd run back and forth as fast as you could in a certain time limit and then you'd come to full draw and you'd have to hit the hit the target um and so uh ideally if you can set up um three or four balloons on your target um you can do you know four of those iterations before you have to go down and get your arrows and, and start again. So I'm still researching exactly the best way to do it. Um, but you need to know when you hit the target and, um, what it does, I think it does a couple of things. It helps you train that stress. So you're used to doing it. It's not perfect. Even on the range fitness side, it's not perfect. We can't in a, in a systematic way, replicate the stress of fear. Right. Mm -hmm. And we can't necessarily replicate the stress you know, that I certainly felt my heart thumping with that buck in front of me that I missed. Um, but I can get used to having a time limit and ha and shooting with my um, heart thumping and also um, getting better uh, and more accurate under, under those situations. And so we'll be working on that um, pretty hard this, uh, this winter, and I hope to publish, you know, some of our findings here after um, – we come up with with the drills and how and how we train it and also work on the fundamentals that transfer to accurate marksmanship under stress right um, maybe it isn't all the fundamentals you hear about by all the geeky guys on the internet when it comes to bow shooting it might be some other stuff that works better all we're interested in doing is increasing your marksmanship under stress um, so what we hope to do is be able to develop these drills and that um, progression in that theory get it out to guys like you have you do it and then see if it helps hunting. <laughs> um, hmm. If it if it doesn't help, then we'll then we'll you know fix it, try something else. But that's where we're hoping to go with it. That's awesome. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, just that whole mindset of how effective can you be under stress? And by effective, it's not perfect. It's not how small of a group can you shoot. It's can you hit the target or not? And the target can be you know that balloon you mentioned, but something the size of vitals or what have you but i mean so many of us and i'm i'm guilty especially in the past of setting up ideal conditions with an ideal stance with no stress and just seeing how you know 
how small of a group, how, you know, can I launch five arrows in there all within this tiny little spot or whatever? And okay, that, that can be good, but hitting, you know, a five inch or a six inch balloon under stress is much more important than throwing five arrows in the size of a half dollar or what have you. You know what we, we've tried to do range fitness with CQB distance. And so that's close quarters battle. That's those guys go clear buildings, right? SWAT teams or Delta or Navy SEAL teams, um, downrange. <clears throat> and we haven't found a really good application for it. One of the reasons is that we could certainly apply our system to that distance. But on the military side, you don't need to be that freaking accurate when you're that close, mm-hmm. right? Mm. And and so we were interested. We were wondering, are you creating a training scar by making these guys that accurate. In other words, they'll take more time to take the shot than they need to. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and I think that applies also to bow hunting. Mm-hmm. Um, so I what, I what I plan to do is probably get a balloon about nine inches diameter or whatever. I think that's like, I was reading, I did some research on this, like the, the vitals and antelope is nine inches and the elk is 14 or something so use the smallest one and the idea isn't to be able to hit five inches or four inches at 40 yards you know it's be able to hit nine inches all the time every time Mm -hmm. um and then instead of making your balloon short smaller at 40 yards take your target back to 50 yards do you see what i mean right so the that that's probably the way that will progress it i i did i do know that at least for mule deer out here, I want to be <clears throat> fairly comfortable at 60 yards. You know, by God, my yard, I was. <laughs> <laughs> You're the 60-yard master. I was, I was like 60-yard master in my yard, but, you know, on the field, <laughs> I was not that accurate. And yeah. so, obviously, I've got work to do. And uh, when, I, when I talk about the distraction, that's that's kind of the distraction is, you know, you get caught up in – really being super accurate when you don't really need to be that accurate. You need to be able to hit that nine inches under stress. And that's a different way of shooting. And so, um, but uh, one of the things that we talk about when we're working with guys who go out in the field, either going into military selection or, you know, doing some climb, we don't want them to get to the field and experience something physically that they haven't felt in training already. And, uh, you know what, that's what I experienced when I was hunting. I was like, yeah, you know, (laughs) uh, my shooting in my yard, it wasn't like this real shooting I'm doing right here. Yeah. This is new uh, territory. Yeah. And that's a, that's a coaching error, right? I Mm miscoached myself. It shows you I'm a slow learner. I guess I should have knew that. I actually wanted to, I actually, you know, had plans to, to, to start deploying range fitness in my own, in my own uh, shooting last summer. But you know what? I got caught up in trying to figure out which bow was working and which, you know, friggin' release was working, you know, and, and, you know, which arrow I should be using because, you know, I have to have this certain spine weight or all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was all a goddamn distraction. I yeah, should have but... been doing range fitness from the, once I could hit the target, I should have started range fitness. <laughs> yeah. Put the time in, nothing replaces it. Yeah. Yeah. Man, that's yeah. interesting. I have so many thoughts. I'd, I love, would love to follow your developments with that. Cause like just that idea of hitting that, you know, that nine inch balloon, it was like, you know, is that contradictory to the idea that you hear so often, which I think is helpful and true of like aim small, miss small, like that mindset of aim very precise so that you're off by a small margin. And how does that affect it? And man, that could go, that could go so many places. We'll have to, we'll have to chat about that and maybe, we might end up doing a whole other show about what, what comes of that shooting. That would be fun. You know, and the beauty of that is those are two theories, right? All that matters is what works for you in the field. Yeah. And so, you know, aim small, miss small might be, might work for you. And, and, uh, and this other system might work for somebody else, but that's one of the beauties of our approach is, um, those are theoretical arguments, which are fine and dandy and certainly have, a place, but all that really matters is what works in the field. And, uh, that'll be our real test. Um, you know, the only problem with bow hunting, of course, it's not like you, I don't know. I might, I might try getting 
hunting coyotes with my bow this year where she get just more opportunities right mm -hmm. um to test it that that's a that's a problem with bow hunting and here in wyoming you can't go out and and uh you know sneak on something and shoot them with a <laughs> yeah. you know a rubber dart because that's called harassment <laughs> Although that would be awesome, but, uh, <laughs> that would be. Fun. <laughs> I wish, I wish, I wish we had some really, you know, smart cows who, <laughs> <laughs> right, we could go try to shoot, you know, or maybe some wily sheep or something where it wouldn't want to do it. But uh, yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Just to get practice, right? Just to see if the theories working. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one of the that's one of the things, obviously. But yeah, we're yeah, that's cool. <laughs> Well, let's transition in, uh, gosh, we're almost 40 minutes into this conversation with a strength and conditioning coach and haven't really talked about fitness much, which is kind of cool, <laughs> but we better cover it, right? Um, so in the first episode we did with you, you know, we got pretty specific about um, some of the demands of backcountry hunting and talked about a plan that you have developed um, specifically, you know, programming to prepare for an extended backcountry hunt. Um, so I don't want to completely rehash that and would definitely encourage all the listeners to go back to episode five and listen to that as we get into it. But I do want to have this conversation and then dive on to some specifics that we didn't cover last time. But just to begin with, just to kind of set some framework, um, what do you see is that are some of the unique fitness or physical demands of backcountry hunting? Um, and some of the sort of specific strength or endurance, um, attributes that the ideal, uh, backcountry hunter, um, should work towards and, you know, balance and physical capabilities and that overall big picture. You know, I think the first one is what we call mountain endurance and there's, there's a couple of different elements to it, but, but practically, um, on the endurance side, we're, we're talking about the ability to hike uphill under load. Um, and, uh, cause you're always loaded when you're at least backcountry hunting. And I think my, you know, my, my pack, my pack was super light. That's one of the things about, I, I'd never hiked like that in the, uh, in the, you know, in this, in August and stuff, hunting those deer, having to carry your damn water up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, a lot of well, a lot of water decisions, but uh, um, but yeah, I, um, so the ability to hike uphill under load, um, and that's a specific type of endurance, and uh, you need to train that. In other words, if you're just running flat on the ground with no pack, it's not the same as hiking uphill under load. So that's from endurance perspective, that's the main one. Um, there is obviously some flat hiking, you know, or coming out, you know, with your load or whatever, but, um, but that's, um, that's the main, that's the main thing that we want to, we want to cover. The next is, um, and there's, there's two elements to that. One is, you know, aerobic endurance or heart lung stuff, um, that's trained specifically for that mode. The second is just strength. Um, you know, just a step under load up, um, just, uh, some strength. The second thing is uh, eccentric leg strength for the downhills. Um, so it turns out that um, when you walk downhill, um, you're actually stopping gravity from pushing your body into the mountain. And every step on that is called eccentric strength training. And in, and in the strength conditioning world, it's much more intense than concentric strength training. So the strength um, going uphill is concentric, and it's less intense than coming downhill. So for morph guys, if they're going to get sore as shit hunting, it's going to be the downhills that get them. And uh, so that's something specifically you need to train for on a strength side is that eccentric leg strength. And then um, uh, the other one is is uh, really core strength. Um, and for uh, um, just not only for carrying your pack um, when you're scouting, but really when you get something down and come out. Um there's just some uh, core strength that's involved there and, and uh, overall leg strength, um, what we call the mountain chassis, kind of the quads up to the, the shoulders um, for carrying that carrying that load out. If you happen to happen to get something down, you don't want to be totally crushed or not be able to do it. So it's really kind of interesting um, fitness demands. On, on one hand, you have you know kind of really you know basic um, endurance demands, but on the other hand, because of the loading involved. Um, and you know, a few athletes in the mountains carry loads out like backcountry hunters. Um, 
you know, and that's all heat centric strength because hopefully you're you're going downhill most of the time. <laughs> yeah, coming uh, out heavy. Yeah, you're coming out heavy. And you you're going downhill. So those are the those are the ones that we really try to try to focus on. Yeah. My we developed that program, and I think we had good luck with it. Mark, you said you used it and, and noticed some changes. We, I'll be taking another look at that program um, again um, here really soon, and uh, we always revisit our programs um, every year, every two years, um, to take a look and make sure that we're using our latest theory. Uh, um, we've changed some ways we train midsection stuff. I probably think we need to do maybe just some unloaded, uh, more unloaded um, endurance training in that program. Um, just a couple of things that we need to to update and change. I'll be, I'll be taking a look at it. But in general, those are the things that you you want to get. And what what is interesting to notice about that is, other than the basic strength stuff, um, those aren't exercises or those aren't fitness demands. You really get lifting barbells or dumbbells around, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you got you to put a pack on and either walk a pillar. Or we we call us doing step ups. Um, there's just no avoiding it. But again, we're interested in not what look, looks good you know or or how jacked you are but how you perform in the mountains and and uh so we, we try to find those a, uh, exercises that transfer and that's all that we're really interested in yeah so when you're doing do you find it better to do like real world application where you actually physically put a pack on and go hike up a hill or can you get better results like working on more specific muscles in the gym um if it Steve, you know that the problem with that for most guys is just the resources um, right. to be able to do that. So we we did an alpine running uh, program last year, and we happen to have – I don't know if you've been to Jackson, but there's a local ski hill here. It has – I mean it, it goes up like 1,500 or 1,800 or 1,600 feet or something in half mile, you know, so it's mm-hmm. a pretty good climb. And it's just an incredible resource, and we actually would, – we would take and load water up, pack, you know, um, get a uh, hike – you know, pretty much straight up water, dump it at the top, run down, repeat. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and uh, we were interested in primarily in vertical gain there. Mm-hmm. And yeah, absolutely. That would be better than doing step ups. Cause there's all these different little, one of the interesting things on the endurance side, it's not only heart and lungs, but there's also what I call the connected tissue. So just, uh, just getting your ankles and your knees and your hips strong for that repeated motion, mm-hmm. right? All those mm-hmm. ligaments and stuff. Um, yeah, if you, if you have a mountain or resource like that, um, it will transfer better to the real thing than doing our step ups. The problem is there's a couple of problems with that. One is a lot of guys don't have that. Um, mm-hmm. the other problem is that weather can mess with you. Yeah. Um, and like even this hill we did <clears throat> to get the vertical feet gain because you had to come down. Um, it took a lot longer. The sessions were longer. And so with step ups, which is the exercise we use in terms of vertical feet, um, the, the training time can be shorter. It depends on, so there's time issues too, right? You right. have to kind of balance all that stuff together. We were interested in, uh, yeah, ideally, you'll, you know, you'd go and do that. If you did it in a systematic way, on the mountain athlete side, you know, guys will say, hey, I'll, you know, if I want to ski, I'm just going to do the sport. I'm just going to ski. Or if I'm just going to mountain bike, you know, I'm just going to mountain bike. And uh, um, certainly they'll get, you know, fairly far doing that, and that's kind of the tradition in on the mountain side. But that's not the way other professional athletes treat it. They understand that mm-hmm. um, a lot of times there's no set progression. Um, you know, they're not taking measurements; they're just going out there and doing it. And the difference between working out and training, mm-hmm. right? You're just going out and doing it. You're 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 working out. If you're training, you know exactly what you're doing that day. You know what time you have to do it in. You know what your load is. You know what you're doing next. You see how the progression works. Um, so there's there's a difference between them. If if we could, yeah, ideally we would, you know, just hike up and down the king. And but uh, um, and it's certainly we here we can we can do that. But a lot of guys in different places can't. I don't know how. I know when I was in Boise, it seemed fairly flat compared to Jackson. You know, <clears throat> so even if you had to hop in your car and drive 30 minutes to find the hill, well, that's an hour. You know, on the right. road that's going to cut in your training time and eventually something's going to give. So it's just different things work together, but go ahead. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I think one thing to keep in mind too is, um, you know, as we talk about being very sports specific for our pursuit, just backcountry hunting, you're not at all advising Rob that we do, you know, just step ups and only 
climb hills under weight year round. Can you kind of talk about the philosophy that you use of sort of like preseason, in season, off season training and what that might look like for us? You know, it's, you know, January now as this comes out and it's not that, you know, all of us need to be doing, you know, an hour worth of step ups today, but we should, if we're, you know, getting weeks out from a hunt, right? So can you kind of walk us through those cycles? Yeah, in general, the closer you get to the season or the trip, the more sport specific you want to train. Um, and there's a couple reasons for that. Um, you'll see this in endurance athletes a lot. They'll, you know, they'll do their running year round and never really take a break and they end up with overuse injuries. And that's one of the main things that, that kind of happens. The other problem is that you'll get strength imbalances where, you know, you'll get, if you're doing step ups every day, your, your quads are going to get huge and, and your upper body's going to melt away. And you kind of need them shoulders and the upper body stuff for the heavy pack as you're coming out. And uh, those strength imbalances can lead to injuries. Um, so in general, the further you are away from the season, the more general your, your training can be. And then as you get closer to the season, the more sport specific it should be. Um, so for, <clears throat> you know, back, back country guys, um, we've kind of developed a packet of plans. I think it's a, uh, um, that we kind of put our plans together to kind of guide lead guys in. It's like seven months and we kind of start out with just some body weight stuff. Um, just some, um, our, none of our stuff is easy and our, our body weight stuff is all assessed and progressed. <laughs> it's no joke, but we kind of start with body weight and just some unloaded running. And then we get into, um, some gym based strength, um, some of our chassis integrity, um, um, core strength work that we do, which is all loaded. We start guys, um, heavy rucking um, or, or carrying a pack around, and then we keep in some distance running. And then we, we move into, we, we pull out of the gym a little bit, have guys do um, move back into body weight, upper body stuff, but we really start pushing um, uh, loaded running. And then we drop them into the, the backcountry plan, which is really focused on getting guys specifically ready for the for the backcountry season. The, our backcountry a hunting plan is no joke, man. It's hard. <laughs> <laughs> and if you come in there not very fit, I mean, it's going to, you know what I mean? You'll get more out of it if you come into it more fit. But in general, that's just, that's just the idea is the more um, general your training can be. And as you get closer, you want to get more sport specific with it. And all our, our programming does that. I get guys who will say, hey, uh, you know, why don't I – just get your backcountry training plan and do it, you know, four times. I'm like, oh, first of all, it's going to get boring as hell. And, <laughs> and then secondly, that's, that's not the idea. You know, you'll, you'll overtrain or, uh, you know, get some energy from doing all the damn step ups. You know, you want to, I want to send people to the mountains fit, but also relatively fresh. Um, so they're able to, you know, have a really good season. Yeah. yeah and I'll, I mean, I can echo that from, myself forcing myself to be a guinea pig um with that last year i i started i think about january last year using some of your programming really went and did that all the way through hunting season and it worked uh phenomenally well just would echo what you said i mean the body weight programming that you have is absolutely no joke um as you mentioned it's sort of assessed so you're doing you know here's what you're at day one and then the program goes off of that and then you're reassessing so you can legitimately see improvement. Um, and I thoroughly enjoyed slash hated that for sure. Um, <laughs> one plan that I, I, I received so much benefit from yet again, hated, and it's something I see you recommend a lot. Um, and after having done it would definitely recommend it as sort of, um, a, I think a good program to do before you get into um the sport specific stuff for what we do so um i i personally am planning on doing this one again leading up to um the big game plan but is the humility uh, program that you have can you kind of talk about what that is and how might that might set um us as backcountry hunters up well for getting sport specific yeah humility's yeah we we uh on a as one of the plans we developed on the tactical side and um yeah it has a uh, um, body weight strength 
Um, so we've seen body weight, strength stuff, but loaded work capacity. And um, I'm just tr- um, bringing it up now to make sure I don't I, – I've designed like 200 plans over the years. So I, <laughs> <laughs> I want to make sure I'm talking the right one. But I think you were doing um, um, loaded vest runs, right? And yeah. uh, stuff with uh, – um, uh, a dumb, uh, some of our dumbbell stuff, the loaded, um, you know, like Scotty Bob's or when right. man makers to runs. Yeah. It's just a great, um, it's just a great, uh, program. What, what I really like about humility is, uh, there's really not a lot of equipment involved. I think you need a, a sandbag and a pair of 25 pound dumbbells and maybe a, um, weight vest or something like that. And you're good. You can even use a pack instead of weight vest if you want. But yeah, it, it kind of, um, like you said, I think it's a great way to kind of get your head right and uh, and increase your level of fitness, um, especially on the uh, work capacity or, or endurance side for kind of loaded movement. Um, when I say get your head right, it's just hard, and so it's good to it's good to kind of understand what. And you guys have been out there more than I have in terms of out there hunting and things aren't going well. <laughs> There's no light at the end of the tunnel, right? Yeah, um, that's part of what. Uh, we have got that feedback over the years is that, you know, your training plans, especially guys, maybe like you, Mark, you do them alone, right? You know, they kind of get you mentally tough. Um, yeah, I think you run in, yeah, I think we have you run in the 25 pound weight fest, you top out at seven miles. That's no joke. Yeah. You know, weight fest. You know, all you're doing an unloaded run. Yeah. You do an unloaded run up to 12 miles. Yeah. It's a, I'm kind of in the middle of one of these cycles myself right now, but yeah, humility is just a great, um, Overall, again, we kind of developed on the tactical side, and there's actually quite a little a bit of a carryover between tactical and what backcountry hunters do because of the loading. Tactical is a little bit heavier, but many of the the exercises and progressions that are in the backcountry big game um, training plan, you know, had their early versions in one of the first plans I developed on the military side, which was a pre-deployment plan for guys going to Afghanistan. Um, so it's kind of interesting how the two mountain and tactical worlds, you know, enhance and improve each other's programming back and forth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So just, I would just throw that out as a personal recommendation. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely not a plan to jump into if you haven't been doing anything. So if you're the guy listening to this in January and you're making your new year's resolution to get in shape, don't start with humility <laughs> by any means, I wouldn't say. <laughs> But if you want to do some of like Rob's body weight programming or some of the other beginner stuff and then work towards humility, um, would wholeheartedly recommend that for sure. Yeah, humility is one of the is one of the plans I, I included in the, in that packet, getting guys ready for uh, um, of the seven months of training, getting ready for the backcountry plan. So it's definitely one that's in there. I think it's the one you write the UD right before jumping in the the backcountry hunting plan. Oh, perfect. So you, well, you've touched on this, Rob, and I just want to spend more time on it because I think it's incredibly important. Um, and I know it's timely to you because your, you know, theories have changed on it. But can you talk about uh, chassis integrity, um, what you mean by that, why it's important to hunting, which again, you mentioned in brief, and then what's changed um, with your philosophies on that and how you've changed your programming accordingly? Yeah, you know, I, I uh, a couple years ago, I kind of got out of the gym, um, my own stuff, and um, just started doing quite a bit more endurance. And I was kind of doing long endurance and um, uh, lots of core training that we had done previously in the gym. Um, we had a couple I thought was really awesome um, midsection training theories that I was deploying and then after about eight weeks I came back in the gym and started doing some squats and some front squats and uh, what I found was that my legs were strong and uh, my core was strong the integrity between kind of that linkage between my lower body and my upper body was weak um, and so what that meant for me is that the core training that we were doing um, was not transferring to actually lifting something heavy. Um, and that's kind of when you really, you know, lifting something heavy or moving to something heavy is when you need your midsection. Um, you don't need it doing sit-ups, right? Um, this stuff should transfer over. And so it caused me to rethink how we are programming midsection um, strength and work. And we, I, I, what I decided is that my, my 
chassis integrity. I didn't have any chassis integrity. There was just no integrity through the entire system. And when we talk about chassis on, we're talking about, the, you know, the, the knees up to the shoulders, that integrity through that system. So we changed our, our uh, theory around quite significantly. We moved away from any um, ground-based core work. So no more sit-ups, no more, you know, leg, you know, flutter kicks, stuff like that. No more bridging, actually. Um, everything was either going to be on your knees or standing because that's we. I felt transferred more to what would happen and what you need your midsection um, outside of the gym. And we also moved away from flexion exercises. So uh, flexion is when you kind of bend forward. So a sit up, you know, is a basic you know flexion exercise. And as I thought about it. <clears throat> I didn't find myself using my midsection in the field to do a sit-up very often, right? Mostly time I was rotating with something or I was trying to keep myself from rotating. I was bracing or I was extending. I was using my low back to pick something up. And so we kind of started focusing on those types of exercises. And then we developed um, – the other thing is that prior we, we would do this typical set rep-based programming so we do like four sets through of 10 reps of four exercises and um, we moved away from that and started uh, programming for time and so now we'll come in and we'll do a circuit of three of these exercises for like 20 minutes i'm um, just grinding through them we don't we're not working frantically just grinding through them and um and we've developed um We've we've made some modifications since I made that change, um, but we've had really good success with it in terms of actual transfer to the field. Um, there's a couple things that can happen to your midsection. One is you'll tweak something either when you're lifting something heavy up and you're not ready for it or it's too heavy. So there's a basic strength demand, but there's also a strength endurance demand. So, you know, when you, you first start hiking out with that monster um, bull you carried or you killed – um, you know, the first couple hours you're doing fine, but hour three, hour four, or whatever, that's when your midsection and everything else starts getting tired, and that's when you can get injured or not perform as well. So there's a real strength endurance demand to the midsection also, and we kind of found these longer, what we call them grinds, um, trade not only strength, but also that strength endurance element. Um, and so we've had really good luck with them. I'm really excited about it. And uh, um, no one else that I know in the, in the country or world is really training the midsection this way. And w with all my theories, of course, it's, you know, we're always tweaking it and, and changing around. And recently we started tweaking it a little bit more. We'll kind of develop something and test it for six or eight months. And, and then I'll think about it and see what the results are and, and tweak it. And we're doing the same with this. But so far it's been really solid. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, we really had great luck with it. It's different type of midsection training than anybody else is doing for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I've, you know, I've done the freaking leg lifts and ab whatever, you know, crunches, but doing this uh, chassis integrity stuff, I picked up the chassis integrity uh, packet from you specifically, so I'll, I'll throw that in there on off days or recovery days, and just, it's it's helped me a ton. I feel stronger through that midsection, but then even things like lower back pain and things like that, because I'm stronger... Even though I'm doing rotation and things like that, that might sound like a bad idea. Um, it's really strengthened that for me and, and made a big difference. And I think when it comes to being under the weight of a pack, it's absolutely uh, critical for sure. Yeah, we, you know, the, I think that back into big game plan has a shitload of them sandbag get ups, right? So you were oh, yeah. <laughs> hammer, hammering through those things. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of interesting that exercise. That's probably my favorite chassis integrity exercise. You get all kinds of good work with that. And <laughs> yeah, for, for guys who aren't familiar, Rob, explain the same get up. I mean, it, it doesn't need explanation, but go ahead and explain it. <laughs> you know, we if you just put a sandbag on your shoulder, you lay down and get up with it. <laughs> There's not it's a lot just of technique that easy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's uh, um, it's probably my favorite. Mid I mean, it. It's a, just a great, it's an incredible work capacity exercise. The first, I mean, it's so interesting to see guys who do it the first time, you know, just the, they get crushed by the sandbag, you know, and uh, there's a mental side to it also. But uh, yeah, it's one of my favorite, uh, it probably is my favorite total body, we call it total body um, chassis integrity exercise. Uh, but it's a great, um, and that's how come I put it in that 
back into your plan. It trains mental fitness. There's a hard work capacity component to it. And, uh, and also get your midsection strong in a real functional way. Mm. Again, we're oh. just interested in stuff that transfers. Go ahead. What, what's the weight of that sandbag typically? In the uh, backcountry plan, I think we start at 60 pounds and you finish at 80. Yeah. Oh, wow. So it's heavy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and the sixty to eighty is a big jump. <laughs> I get to the point yeah, with yeah. I get to the point with sixties, which I mean, sixties were horrible when I started, but I got to the point where I was like, I was keeping some of my own metrics on like how many I could do in ten minutes, for example, and I got pretty happy with where I was at, or so I thought. And it probably wasn't even all that great anyway, but you know, when you're training alone and in your own head, you think you're pretty awesome. And uh, <laughs> man, when I jumped to eighty, it was like holy cow! I was like starting all over again. Well, it's kind of interesting. I. I did shoot a deer this year and I was able to get the whole thing in my pack. And of course I put my pack on laying down, right? Um, get my straps on and it's just a sandbag get up, getting up with that pack. Yeah. <laughs> just a heavy one. Yeah. So it's uh, something hopefully we really transfers to. And, uh, yeah, I love that exercise. My athletes don't like it that much, but yeah, we, we love it. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Well, this has been an, a great conversation, Rob. There's, I'm sure, going to be a ton of questions coming out of this. There's so much that uh, I wanted to cover that we didn't get to, but that's that's the way things work when there's so much to talk about. So I um, want to point folks to your site as well as ways to get in contact with you, things like that. I will say, first of all, um, it, before I forget to mention it, on your site, you guys have one of the coolest pages of exercises that I've seen um, I mean, there's probably, do you know how many there are on there, Rob? Like, I mean, it's definitely over a hundred, right? Examples with videos of specific exercises. Yeah. You know, it, uh, we, we just produced, I mean, we'll be 10 years old here next month. And so, um, over the course of years, we've kind of made some of our own exercise and use others. And gosh, I don't know how many there are. It's kind of interesting. We were talking earlier about sophisticated design being immature. And, uh, over the years, my, my the plans I use now use far fewer exercises than the plans in the past. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, there's just an incredible amount of, of great uh, great exercises on there, and uh, um, I, I don't know how many, but a bunch of them. Yeah, so just want to make sure that you guys have that. You know, as as somebody who's and I'm not saying this because it's not a paid endorsement, nothing like that. I mean, I've bought programs from Rob well before you know we were doing this, but. You know, for guys like myself who are training on your own, um, and then also I train at home, so I have limited equipment, uh, kettlebells, dumbbells, sandbag, weight vest, uh, pull-up bar, things like that. Um, Rob has some awesome plans, um, would wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly recommend them. And then that's the thing is even though you're training alone and you're following programming from um, someone who's not there to coach you, you have all the examples of every exercise, what it is and how to do it correctly. Um, but Rob, what's your site? Where can guys find, um, your programming and things of that nature? Yeah, the site is, uh, mtn tactical.com. So that's Mike Tango November, the, uh, the word tactical.com. And, uh, I answer dozens of emails, um, every week about, um, people have questions about fitness programming and just rob at mtn tactical.com happy to answer a bunch of them we uh um we're really open to guys and want to be successful yeah the cool thing too uh to throw that out there is all those essentially almost all those questions that you're answering by email you guys usually put up what is it like a weekly post of questions that you received as well as your responses so there's even if you search the site, a whole bunch of uh, nuggets of gold in those Q and A posts that you guys have as well. Yeah, we get uh, we, we have like I forget how many years of them now, but uh, yeah, we answer lots of questions. Um, and it's good. I mean, it's a uh, it's kind of exciting to see. You know, we talked about getting distracted. I think that on the backcountry hunting side, guys can get you know distracted by gear and stuff and forget about their fitness. And um, and uh, gosh, you spent all that money. It's good to get out there and not suffer, you know, and be able to enjoy the experience and physically it's good. I think also it's kind of neat to, <clears throat> and what feedback we've heard is that, you know, by doing the training, you know, I, you know, the eight or 10 weeks or whatever it is, you're going to start before you do your trip. It kind of helps extend the trip a little bit more in a, in a demented way, but it does. So you get kind of more out of it. <clears throat> yeah. 
I certainly had to remind myself why I was doing, you know, 50 minutes of step ups <laughs> and pretending I was on the mountains. So yeah, it, it extended it in a way. <laughs> yeah, I, I got into listening to books, which is a lot better now. So, but yeah, the, yeah I definitely get to get the audio, audio book. <laughs> <It'll help. laughs> That's funny. Well, Rob, thank you so much for the time and for joining us. Yeah, fellas, thank you so much and good luck yeah. to you. Well, thank you so much to Rob, and thank you, the listener, for joining us. Again, the show notes for this episode are at exomountaingear.com forward slash 62. Again, I share some of my experience with Rob's program in those show notes, some of my favorite movements that I picked up, and how I prepare for backcountry big game hunts with Rob's help. So we're not affiliated with Rob or his gym or selling programs or anything like that. It's simply a matter of the fact that I have done a ton of research and I found that Rob is not only um, well-versed, he's well-experienced, he knows what he's talking about in terms of preparing the body physically for the outdoors, and I have used uh, more than a handful of his programs to prepare for my own hunting and have had great success. So if you have any questions, go ahead and contact us. You can contact Rob. All of those links, all of that information are on the show notes. Thank you guys so much for listening. If you are enjoying the show, leaving us a review in iTunes or wherever else you might be listening to this helps us tremendously. We will catch you on the next show. Thanks for tuning in.